All right, welcome back to Cognitive Psychology. This is week 12, class number two. And today we're gonna to be starting our look at chapter nine, conceptual knowledge. This is our first look into the areas that are known as higher cognition. And uh, we are going to focus on that for the rest of the semester. So we're gonna take a look at those higher order, higher level cognitive processes that we're capable of, things like knowledge, things like decision-making and things like language. So this is day two of our face-to-face -face shutdown. So without further ado, let's begin our look at conceptual knowledge. So what we're gonna be covering today is gonna to be a look at the sort of basic idea of how conceptual knowledge is organized uh, in our minds. So we do have conceptual knowledge, we know things, we know of things, we can think about things. So how are these all organized? We're gonna introduce the idea of the semantic network. After that, we're gonna take a look at one of the first proposed semantic network, uh, Colin and Killian's hierarchical model. We are then gonna see a modification of that model with Collins and Loftus's spreading activation model. And then we're gonna test that spreading activation model with our lexical decision cog lab. And then we're gonna spend the remainder of today's class taking a look at some very important implications that the spreading activation model has in understanding racism, in understanding sexism, uh, understanding any of the isms, and also taking a look at how they develop and more importantly, how they can be uh, reversed or how those effects can be unlearned uh, when you learn them. So let's begin with our look at the basics of a semantic network. So we talked about semantic memory before and semantic here is being used in the same way. It is your knowledge of things. It's your knowledge of stuff. It's your knowledge of concepts that you can declare, that you can say things about your understanding about what things actually mean. So we have that organized in our minds in some way. And this is cognitive psychology's attempt to understand how is that information organized? So according to the cognitive psychology and according to the semantic network approach, your semantic knowledge, the things that you know, can be thought of as a list of propositions, just a list of facts and a list of statements about things that you know. So for example, you might have a proposition somewhere in your mind, represented somewhere in your mind, that says Lincoln, who was the president of the United States, freed the slaves. So that is a proposition. And if you know that proposition, if you know that piece of semantic information, that means that that proposition is represented in your mind somewhere. It's represented somewhere in your memory. And this is a look at how is it represented in your memory. So according to the general idea of the semantic network, propositions are represented as uh, nodes. So these are the relations, these are the arguments, these are the sort of pieces to the puzzle. And then there are links. And the links let you know how these nodes are related uh, to each other. So let's take a look at an example of that. So again, we have an idea of a proposition uh, for example, Lincoln, who was president of the United States, freed the slaves. And we're going to see how that's represented as a series of nodes with a series of links between them. And this is, again, that representational stage of understanding for our cognition. How might these things be represented in our mind? What might be the strategies uh, that we use to represent information? And then as we're going to see in the COG lab, as psychologists, we later test those theories to see if those actually match up to our behavioral outputs. So let's take a look at this semantic network. So we start off with a node. So this node is an agent node. So that's the argument, that's the relation, sorry, that's the relation. So the relation is agent uh, for this particular node. And the argument on it is Lincoln. So what that means is that this agent uh, is Lincoln. So Lincoln is the person or thing doing things is the person that is the agent and then we have a link a relational link uh oh, sorry then we have a not a relational link another argument where the relation is that lincoln is president of and then we have the final uh argument where the object of this is united states so this is one note so this one node with its relations and its arguments represents Lincoln, president of United States. We then have another node over here 
that has an agent that links to Lincoln as well. So now we have two nodes that are linked together. Both are linked through the same agent. And now this new node has a new relation, a new argument on it that is the argument of being freed. And it has a new object, which is the object of slaves. So this entire semantic network now with its various relations and arguments and the link between Lincoln in those two nodes, this represents in our minds that Lincoln, president of United States, freed the slaves. So those two nodes together can represent that proposition uh, in our mind. Now, let's just for educational purposes, uh, assume or, or hypothesize that whoever's semantic network this is, let's say that they just got hit in the head. They just got hit in the head with a cartoony baseball and they got the, the stars swirling around their head. And uh, this causes some damage to their semantic network. If the bump on their head changes Lincoln to Bill Gates, if that's the effect of this brain injury, then the proposition that is represented now changes from Lincoln, who was president of the United States, freed the slaves, to Bill Gates, who was president of the United States, freed the slaves. So that's not a correct proposition at all, but that's how it would be represented in this particular person's mind. Now, if this person got hit in the head one more time and the United States changed into Microsoft, then the proposition changes into Bill Gates, who was president of Microsoft, freed the slaves. And then if we continue with the head trauma uh, and the relation of freed changes to programmed, then we get the proposition, Bill Gates, who was president of Microsoft, programmed the slaves. And you probably know what this is, uh, where this is headed. One more hit to the head, one more uh, change in the network. Slaves, because of the injury, gets changed into Windows. And now all of a sudden we have a new proposition, a new true proposition. Bill Gates, who was president of Microsoft, programmed Windows. So that's an example of a semantic network. And as you can see, two very different propositions, but both are represented or both have the same sort of structure. So those relations between propositions and then what their arguments are, what their pro, uh, what the relations are about, uh, all of those come together to be able to represent every single proposition that we have, every single piece of knowledge that we have can be potentially represented in a semantic network, much like the ones that we just took a look at. All right, so the semantic knowledge can be thought of as a list of uh, propositions. So the next question that psychologists ask uh, is, how is this semantic network organized? What are the links between different ideas? How are the links, uh, how are those links uh, organized uh, in our minds? Uh, which concepts are linked to each other? Which concepts are linked to each other only through other concepts? And what implications might that have for behavior? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at one of the first models that was trying to say, if we have a semantic network, how is this semantic network organized? And this was Collins and Killian's hierarchical model. So this hierarchical model, not surprisingly, it's right in the title, basically said that our concepts, our semantic network is organized in a series of hierarchies, where upper hierarchies, upper levels can uh, connect to lower levels, lower levels connect to still lower levels. And you have to traverse all these levels in order to access your, uh, your information. So this is as if we're looking into your long-term memory where you've stored all this semantic information. And if you know things about animals, you represent the things that is uh, true of most animals in general, and you'll have an animal node. And on that animal node, you will have uh, links to features of that animal node. So you will have a link that says animals have skin. You will have a link that says animals can move around. Animals are mobile, right? Unlike plants, animals can move around. You'll have a link that says animals can eat. You'll have a link that says animals can breathe. So everything that you know about animals in general will be attached to that animal load at that top level. Now, anything that you know about specific animals will be located in the next hierarchy down. It'll be located in the next level down. 
So you might know things about animals in general, but you then might also know, hopefully, we know about birds uh, in general as well. So birds are animals, so they are on the next level down. They're on that next sub-level down. And there are certain things we know about birds in general. So birds have wings. Birds can fly. Uh, birds have feathers. And then uh, we know that about birds in general, but we also know things about specific birds. So we go down one more level to another sub-level, and this is where we store knowledge about specific birds, uh, specific semantic information about uh, different species of birds. So for example, a canary uh, can sing, and a canary is yellow, and an ostrich is tall. And notice that an ostrich has the feature of can't fly attached to it. So birds in general can fly, but there's an exception. Ostriches, they can't fly, and an ostrich has long, thin legs. And this is the type of organization that would be true for any uh, animal that we know. So fish have fins, can swim, have gills. And then we know things about different types of fish, like sharks, they can bite and they're dangerous. Salmon is pink and is edible. So this is Colin and Killian's hierarchical model of how all of the information that we have, all of our semantic information is organized in our mind according to these different hierarchies. So there are certain features of Colin and Killian's uh, model of this conceptual uh, knowledge. It is a propositional network, but it comes with some assumptions about how this information was organized. So assumption number one was that if you wanted to retrieve a property, if you wanted to know something about animals, that they have skin, or if you wanted to know something about birds, that they have wings, that takes time. It takes time in your mind to access that information. And also, traversing the hierarchy takes time as well. So if you're thinking about animals, and then you have to think about a specific, uh, if you have to think about birds, it takes time to go from the animal node and shift your thought to the bird node, right? So it takes time to traverse that one level of the hierarchy. All right, so that's assumption number one. Assumption number two is that the times that it takes you to travel around the hierarchy, they're additive when one step is dependent upon the completion of another. So the easiest example of this, if you're thinking about animals and somebody asks you, can a canary sing? You would have to go from animal to bird to canary and then uh, access can sing. So those individual steps take time. And the assumption is, is that the total time that it takes you to answer that question will be additive the, of each and every single individual step. So you should be much quicker if you're thinking about animals at answering the question, do animals have skin? Whereas if you're thinking about animals answering the question, can birds fly? So every time you have to move around the hierarchy, it takes extra time. All right, assumption number three, uh, the time to retrieve a property is independent of the hierarchy level. And what this means is that it doesn't matter if you're in the top level, it doesn't matter if you're in the bottom level, the time that it takes you to access a feature that's attached to a node, to access that property that's attached to a node is the same. So do animals have skin? You can access animals have skin as quickly as ostriches can't fly because they are at different levels, but they're still accessing those properties. So that would still take exactly the same time. All right. So we have this model. Maybe it's the way that our minds are organized. Maybe it's not the way that our minds that are organized. So Collins and Killians ask, well, what would happen if conceptual knowledge was organized this way? What are the behavioral consequences if we had this hierarchical model? And what they proposed was that if we had this hierarchical model, then there would be different reaction times to verify the truth of different sentences. And these different reaction times will depend upon how many hierarchies have to be traversed. So they set up this really interesting experiment, very cool idea, where they sort of mapped out what the possible hierarchy could be for a variety of sentences and a variety of propositions. And then they designed sentences that would require you to traverse numerous hierarchies in order to answer the particular question. So they had things like superset questions. And this is questions where you are going from node to node. You don't have to access a property. You're going from node to node. And some of these questions, these superset questions, 
required zero nodes to be traveled, zero levels to be traveled. An example of that is a canary is a canary. So if somebody asks you, hey, can you tell me, is a canary a canary? All you have to do is access that one node. So that's kind of the default setting. That's kind of the, as quick as you can possibly be, right? That's as quick as you could possibly answer a particular question. So that's kind of the control condition. More interesting though, is what happens when you have to start traversing a hierarchy. So if somebody came up to you and said, hey, as quick as you can, can you tell me is a canary a bird? Well, in order to answer that question, you start at canary and you gotta jump up to bird. And you have to make sure that there's a link between canary and bird. So the time that it takes you to jump up to that second level is gonna be measured in your reaction time. So a canary is a bird should take longer, according to Colin and Killian's model, it should take longer than verifying whether a canary is a canary. And then if you ask another question, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, as fast as you can, is a canary an animal? Well, now you have to start at canary. You got to jump up to bird. And then from bird, you got to jump up to animal. And those two jumps are going to take you much longer than one jump. And one jump is going to take you much longer than zero jumps. So the more levels you have to go, the longer your reaction time should be. All right, so we have those superset questions. And then they had another type of question, which they called property sentences. And a property sentence is much like a superset question, but it required the access of a property. It required, it required you to access a property. So an example of the basic uh, uh, level zero property sentence would be a canary is yellow. So for that, you don't have to travel up different levels. You can just say, well, a canary, let me access the properties. Is yellow is one of the properties. So yes, a canary is yellow. And then if somebody came up to you and said, hey, as quick as you can, can you tell me, does a canary have feathers? Well, now you start, at, start out at canary, but you have to jump up to bird and that's gonna take time. And then you have to access has feathers and that's gonna take time. So this sentence should take longer to verify if our brains, if our minds are organized in this manner. And then finally, if somebody asks you, hey, as quick as you can, does a canary have skin? Well, in that case, you got to start a canary, you got to jump up to bird, and then from bird, you got to jump up to animal, and then from animal, you have to access has skin, and then that is going to take you much longer than any of the previous sentences. So here are some sentences from the actual study that uh, Collins and Killians uh, performed. So things like baseball has innings, baseball is directly connected to innings. So we're asking for a property that is at that node. But something like badminton has rules. Badminton is connected to games. Games is connected to the property of has rules. So that requires one uh, level of traversing. So they had one level sentences, two level sentences, three uh, level sentences. So uh, all of those should take longer and longer as the levels that you needed to access increased. So that was their prediction, different reaction times to very different sentences. What did they find? Well, here is the graph from their study. So we're gonna go through this uh, bit by bit here. So the first thing to, uh, to notice is that here on the X axis, we have the levels of the true sentences. So this was the uh, these were the levels for sentences that were true. Things like a canary is a canary. Things like a canary is yellow. A canary can fly. So that is the level of the sentences. So we have zero, we have one, and we have two. And then on the x-axis here, we have the mean reaction time in milliseconds. So 1,000 milliseconds is a second. It goes all the way up here to a second and a half. So these are the measures of the reaction time. The higher the number, the higher up in the bar, the longer it took somebody to verify a particular sentence. All right, so let's start with the uh, property sentences. So if somebody asks you as quick as you can, can you tell me whether a canary can sing? That took Colin and Killian's uh, subjects about 1.3 seconds. So it takes about 1.3 seconds for you to access your, your hierarchy, uh, access your semantic knowledge and say, yes, yes, a canary can sing. Now, if somebody asks you, all right, quick as you can, a canary can fly. Well, you have to start out at canary and then you have to jump up to access canary can fly. 
And lo and behold, it actually takes longer. It actually, your reaction time increases. It takes you longer to verify the sentence, uh, a canary can fly. It takes longer than a canary can sing. And then if you have to go up two levels, right? So a canary can fly. You start a canary, you have to go to bird. If you want to if you want to answer, does a canary have skin? You start a canary, you then got to go to bird, you then got to go to animal. And lo and behold, for a canary can sing, that took the longest. So here we can see clear evidence of this sort of hierarchical structure that it took longer. And look how straight that line is. It takes you the exact same time to go from level one to two as it does to go from level two to three. So it really seems, uh, this is very strong evidence that Colin and Killian's hierarchical model, you take the same time to traverse every single, um, uh, every single uh, uh, level. And notice also, and this I forgot to mention, notice also that the time here also includes the time required to access a property. So a canary can sing, you stay, you stay at canary, you access one of the properties. A canary can fly, you go from canary to bird, access one of the properties. A canary has skin, you go from canary to bird to animal, access one of the properties. So this is the time required to traverse levels and access a property. Now, what about just traversing levels? What about questions like, is a canary a canary? Well, that only took one second to verify. So that's our kind of baseline. That's as fast as anybody could do this task is about one second to hear the question, press the button, you know, make your, make your arm move. So that's our kind of baseline level. However, what happens when you have to verify a sentence that requires you to traverse one level, like a canary is a bird? Well, the prediction is that the reaction time should increase and lo and behold, there it is, an increased reaction time. So they found that traversing a level actually takes time. And then also, if you have to traverse two levels, is a canary an animal? You gotta go from canary to bird, bird to animal and that takes one more step one more hierarchy and uh, that has a higher higher reaction time as well so this is very clean data i mean look at those lines they're just about as straight as you could possibly imagine verifying or providing evidence for those assumptions that collins and killians made that traversing a hierarchy takes the same amount of time regardless of where you are and accessing a feature takes the same amount of time regardless of where you are and also that the times add up, that they add up as you go up and down that hierarchy. So what do the reaction times uh, tell us um, about the hierarchy? Well, if you do the math, if you kind of take a look at the slopes and uh, crunch a little bit of data, you see that it takes you about 75 seconds to travel up from one level to the next level. So if you take a look at the data here, you will find that going from here, oh, wait, sorry, it takes you about, 75 milliseconds to travel up uh, a level. Let's rewind that a little bit. It was a little spoiler there for you. So it takes about 75 milliseconds to travel up a level. So if you take a look at the slope of these lines, the slope of these lines is about 75 milliseconds per level. So each time you have to go a level up, it takes our minds about 75 milliseconds to cross that distance in our hierarchy. And that's regardless of whether you're going from one to two or two to three. All right. What does it tell us about accessing a property? This is a really cool feature of this particular graph. So what does it tell us about accessing a property? Well, we can get that by comparing the two lines because a canary is a canary requires you to traverse zero levels, right? A canary is a canary. You just stay at the same level. A canary can sing also traverses zero levels. So in this case, those two questions both traverse the same amount of levels. However, the one difference is, is that a canary is a canary does not require accessing a property. A canary can sing requires you to access a property. So this difference between those two reaction times, that's how long it takes you to access a property. And it takes you about 300 milliseconds to access a property. And you'll notice that that number is pretty much standard, whether you're going from uh, zero hierarchies up to uh, and accessing a property or whether you have to traverse one hierarchy and then access a property. So this difference here is also approximately 300 uh, milliseconds. And then also if you're going up three levels and then have to access a property, same kind of difference. So it takes you about 75 milliseconds to travel up a property. 
and I guesstimated it, but crunched the numbers earlier before, it takes you about 225 milliseconds to actually retrieve a property. So this was very strong evidence for Colin and Killian's hierarchical model that our knowledge is actually organized in these hierarchies and that it takes time to move through those hierarchies just as if you're like traveling up and down uh, stairs. All right, so that's Colin and Killian's hierarchical model. As you might suspect, uh, the fact that we're going to be looking at a second model of uh, semantic uh, knowledge, uh, your semantic networks, means that Collins and Killian's model ran into some difficulties. So there were some difficulties with the model, some challenges that people just could not, uh, Collins and Killian just could not account for in their model. So these problems include things like the typicality effect. So some properties are very typical and some nodes are very typical of um of a certain category and those were found to be faster than nodes that are atypical so a great example of this here is canary versus ostrich canary is a very typical bird right it's a very kind of classic bird if if, if you ask people to just name birds that they know canary is going to come up and canary is much like many many other birds ostrich is an exception right the big thing is it is it doesn't fly it's also huge, right? It's bigger than most people think birds, you know, typically are. So as they found, there was a typicality effect. You're faster with canary than you are with ostriches. You're faster thinking about canaries than you are thinking about ostriches. And that is not predicted by Collins and Killian's hierarchical model. All right. And then the other, uh, another issue was that the structures are not perfectly hierarchical. And it is actually extremely difficult to organize all of our knowledge into just these hierarchical structures because they're just, if you're trying to organize things in categories, sometimes it gets very difficult to know whether something is a subcategory of something else. Animals here were used as a great example because they're oftentimes very easily uh, organized in these levels. But other information that we have might not be so perfectly hierarchical. So how does this, uh, how did they ad uh, adjust for this? Well, Collins went on uh, working uh, with Loftus and uh, made a new model called the spreading activation model. And the spreading activation model was a response to those criticisms of typicality and not perfectly hierarchical information. And what they did in the spreading activation model was they revised the hierarchical model and they got it, they put in new features. So the first one is that it's not strictly hierarchical. So the levels are gone. It's not organized according to very strict uh, different levels. It's organized more in terms of connections, which you're going to see in just a moment. And the other new feature was that links between comments, a concept, sorry, have different travel times. So unlike the Collins and Killian's hierarchical model, where traveling to different parts of the model took the same time, in this new spreading activation model, the links could be longer or shorter. And it could take you longer to travel between two concepts or shorter to travel between two concepts, depending upon how long their link is. And then a very important feature of this, you can tell by the name, was the idea of spreading activation. And spreading activation means that activation, um, activating a node, bringing it to life, accessing the information, that operation on a node can spread from that particular node uh, to different category and exemplar nodes. So the activation of one area of this model can spread, much like ripples on a pond, it can spread to other connected areas uh, in the model. So let's take a look at uh, an example of that. So we're gonna take a look at a number of different concepts here. So let's start off with the concept of red. So if you know what the word red is referring to, you have a concept of red that is uh, represented in your mind. And things that get linked to this concept of red in the spreading activation model are things that are typically red. So things like a fire engine would be connected to the concept of red. And then things that get connected to fire engine can be things that are categorical. So the fire engine is a vehicle, fire engine is a truck, or it could get things that are associated with the fire engine, such as ambulances. So an ambulance and a fire engine, they're both emergency vehicles. Fire engine is a truck, so all of these would have links between each other. And then everything that you know is somehow linked to other nodes in your spreading activation semantic network. So streets 
would be linked to vehicle. Car would be linked to vehicle. Car would be linked to truck. Bus would be linked to truck. Not saying that bus and truck are the same thing, but they are related, right? They're kind of the same thing. They're both big vehicles. And then all these links could have links between them. And this is starting to build this particular model. So red would be associated with other colors. So even though red is the opposite of green, if you've been around Christmas long enough, you've seen red and green go together so much that they'll have links between themselves. And then those colors can also have links between each other. Other things that are red will be linked to the concept of red, like roses and apples and cherries. Apples and cherries are fruits and they'll be linked to the idea of pears. Apples and cherries will be linked to each other. And then red will also be associated with sunrise and sunset. And that weather, those weather phenomenon will be associated with clouds and with each other. So you can see that this spreading activation model kind of builds and links everything that kind of goes together. So you'll see that bus is not linked to cherry because a bus and a cherry, they don't really go together in any sort of experience that we've ever had. But a cherry and an apple, if you've ever gone to buy pies, there they are, cherries and apples. If you've ever seen pictures, cherries and apples, very similar. So those two are linked in this model. So this revision of the hierarchical model, this spreading activation model, it uh, has a few concepts that are specific to this model. And one of them is called association priming. And association priming is the idea that according to this model, your response times should be faster if your second item is associated with the first. Now, this is something that people have found before. So if you're thinking of doctor, you'll be very quick to think of nurse. If you're thinking of doctor, you won't be very fast to think about butter because butters and doctors don't go together. But if you're thinking of bread, you're much more, uh, you're going to be much faster to think about butter than if you're thinking about bread you, uh, when you think about nurse, because bread and nurse just don't go together. And that's all part of this spreading activation model. So the idea of the spreading activation is if I tell you the word red, you activate the node red. As soon as you're thinking about the word, uh, about the concept of red, that node gets activated. So it goes from unactivated to activated. And then as soon as it gets activated, that activation spreads like ripples in a pond to other nodes that are connected to the concept of red, and then they get activated. They're activated less, they're activated less, they might not even be activated to a conscious level, but they're more activated than when they're dormant. And that's important, they're closer to being able to be called into consciousness, they're closer to be able to being thought of. And this activation continues further, so fire engine activates ambulance and truck. Cherry and apple activate pear. Now it's a less lower activation. Again, much like ripples in a pond, they get lower and lower as you go out further and further away from where the rock was dropped in. But importantly, they're above zero activation. They're above that zero level of uh, activation. So that's the idea of uh, um, spreading activation. And it's, again, one of the possibilities of why association priming uh, is, the, uh, is the phenomenon that we have. So why is it that you're faster thinking about a word if the first word was associated with it? So the prediction here and the explanation from the spreading activation model is that you should be much quicker about thinking about fire engines if I just said red. If I said red and then fire engine, you should be very quick to think about fire engine. If I said red and then cloud, you should not be very quick to think about cloud. And if I said red and then street, you should be even you should be even slower to activate street because street has to be activated, if you can see it here in this model, from an activation level of zero. No activation made it out to street. It is not at all ready to be brought up into consciousness. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at uh, some evidence for this spreading activation model. When we take a look at COG lab number 10, uh, and this is your lexical decision, uh, COG Lab. All right, so COG Lab number 10, lexical decision. This is gonna be a test of Colin and Loftus's spreading activation model. So what we did in this <coughs> COG Lab is you were presented with words and non-words. So words would include things like the word doctor. Non-word would include something like the word blar. And your task was simply to determine whether the presented item was a valid word 
or whether it was an invalid word. So yes to doctor, no to blar. And you needed to do this as quickly as possible. So you would see something like this presented and as fast as you could, you had to click on non-word or word. So non-word for speed, word for manner. And it recorded how fast you responded to each of these particular words. So what we have here is that uh, in this experiment, the words were actually presented in pairs. So unknown to you, these words when they were being presented were being presented in pairs. They were presented one at a time, but the words were associated with each other according to three different conditions. So in some cases, the words were associated words, two words that went together. In other cases, the words were unassociated words, two words that didn't go together. And then finally, we have two non-words, and this is almost a control condition because two non-words definitely don't go together. So an example of two associated words would be the following. It would be something like doctor. So how quick can you say doctor is a word? So you click on word, and then the very next word is associated with doctor. So it's nurse. So you can see that those two are associated words. Unassociated words are concepts that don't go together. So the first word is butter, and then the next word is thread, right? Butter and thread. Nobody thinks, nobody ever says, hey, can you hand me that butter and thread? Those two don't go together. And then the final condition was the non-word condition. And this is almost the uh, control condition here where we just wanna see how fast can you do this particular task. So what if there is absolutely no association whatsoever? So speed is not part of your network. Firth is not part of your network. So those two are the absolute least associated words. Like that's as unassociated as you can get to meaningless non-words. So let's take a look at uh, what the results are. So here we have uh, upcoming is gonna be the results. On the x-axis here, we have the type of relationship. So this is the type of pair that we're looking at. So either associated, unassociated, or non-words. And then here on the y-axis, we have reaction time in milliseconds. And notice that you're pretty quick in this because we're only going to have to go up to 900 milliseconds. So it only goes up as high as just under a second. And uh, we're, it goes in between about half a second to uh, just under a second. So we're going to take a look at non-words first because that's your kind of control condition. And for the non-words, that took you about almost 900 milliseconds to indicate that it's not a word. So that was your reaction time for non-words. And importantly, this is react the reaction time for the second non-word. This is the reaction time for the word that came after the first part of the word pair. So in our previous examples, this would be how fast you could click that first was a non-word. So how fast were we on the second word of the unassociated pairs? Well, there's your reaction time for the second word on the unassociated pairs, those unrelated uh, pairs. So how fast were you at verifying that thread was a word when the first word that came before it was butter? So that's the speed there. And then if the spreading activation model is true, then the associated words should be faster than the unrelated words. So we should see a lower reaction time for the second word in an associated pair. And lo and behold, there we have it. So those are the related words, the ones that are connected in the spreading activation model. And because we're gonna focus in on these two, let's zoom in, let's change the scale here so we can actually see the difference. So we're gonna change the scale of the Y axis. So there it is right there. And as you can see, there is a clear difference between the reaction times to the related words and the unrelated words. It is much faster. You are much faster uh, in your reaction time through related words. And when I say much faster, if you take a look at the numbers, it's only about 10 to 15 milliseconds. But in cognitive psychology terms, that's forever. That's a huge difference. So this was very strong evidence about the uh, spreading activation model. The associated words spread activation and activated those second words uh, more so that they were faster to be brought into consciousness so you can make a decision about them than the unassociated words. So Collins and Loftus spreading activation model, uh, it accounts for the faster reaction times between associated words and unassociated words, specifically because those associated words, they are connected in the model. And because they're connected, when you hear the first word, 
the second word gets partially activated. So it's already kind of ready to be uh, brought into consciousness. It's already sort of ready to get brought into that uh, decision-making level of activation. Whereas for the unrelated words, it has to go, the second word has to get activated all the way from zero. And that does take uh, extra time. So that's how it accounts for associated words versus unassociated words. And when you think about that decrease in reaction time for associated words, and when you think about the Loftus spreading activation model, if we're talking about associated words versus unassociated words, you're faster at recognizing nurse after seeing doctor than you are recognizing thread after seeing bread. This is one of those kind of lab results where you can you take a look at it and if you don't connect it to the real world you might just sit there and go all right big deal you know i'm, I'm not fast when i'm thinking about bread and thread or butter and thread it's, it's not a big huge issue but it's how we behave and basic ideas like this about how we operate in our higher cognition can have huge implications in terms of how we relate to each other and how we behave with each other and this model actually has big implications for stereotypes, for racism, for sexism, for any of the isms and how they develop and how they're perpetuated. And importantly, how they can be reversed, how they can be unlearned, how those isms and stereotypes uh, can be broken. So let's take a look at uh, some of these um, stereotypes and some of these kind of racist ideas. So we're gonna take a look at racial stereotypes take a look at an analysis of that and how the spreading activation model can account for some of these stereotypes we're going to take a look also at a relatively new uh, stereotype which is the idea of toxic masculinity and how toxic masculinity as a concept was itself a victim of toxic masculinity and you'll see what i mean in just a moment but let's start off with uh, a look at uh, racial stereotypes so if you ask anybody, and this is going to be, take a little bit of understanding here, that we're talking about these stereotypes because they're human behaviors. There's, uh, you know, there's no truth to the matter. Uh, there's no uh, evidence that these are actually uh, the case. However, they are part of our behavior. Racism is part of our behavior. And as psychologists, we want to be able to understand that so that we can live in a world free of a lot of these negative uh, ways of thinking. So when you think about negatives associated with African-American males, a lot of those negative stereotypes are things like uh, an association with guns, and they're things like an association with drugs, and they're things like an association with promiscuous sexual activity. And these are just stereotypes that you don't have to be racist in order to know in fact, you could ask the president of the NAACP, what are the stereotypes associated with African-American males? And if they know the stereotypes, that means it's represented somewhere in their mind. So knowing a stereotype does not mean that you're racist. And that's important to go for uh, when you're thinking about this going forward, because the two of them are completely different things. However, they do relate to each other. So how are these stereotypes formed? Well, one possibility is that they're formed because of the images that we see of African-American males and the images that are associated with those African-American males. So every single time you see a news article like this, Gary police search for shooter after finding guns, drugs uh, in house, that picture of an African-American male, as soon as you see this article, there's an association, there's a link that is formed between African-American male and guns, African-American male and drugs. So just the same way that associations are formed between doctors and nurses, because you continually see doctors and nurses, doctors and nurses, doctors and nurses, this, this type of an image, if it occurs over and over and over again, will form an association in your mind, however unfair, however incorrect, but it will form an association in your mind between, in this case, African-Americans and guns, African-American male and drugs. And this occurs in the news, this can occur in the movies. So if you see Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction, once again, take a look at this image. You're taking a look at an African-American male and a gun. So that association between those two concepts becomes much, much stronger. And this happens every single time that you see it. So if you're one of the eight people that saw Idris Elba 
in the uh, Stephen King's uh, The Tower. Uh, I forget what the actual, it was The Something Tower. You can tell exactly how, uh, how huge this movie was. But again, importantly, African-American male with guns. So the more you see these images associating African-American males with, you know, different uh, concepts, those links become stronger and stronger and stronger. So if you regularly partake in, you know, watching hip hop videos, uh, then you will see images of African-American males being promiscuous. And that link between those two concepts will get stronger and stronger and stronger. So let's take a look at how this can be represented in Collins and Killian, sorry, Colin Loftus's spreading activation model. So we have this concept of African-American male, and it's gonna have links to other concepts. And the more we see African-American males with drugs, African-American males in the news with drugs, African-American males in the movies with drugs, that link between the idea of African-American males and drugs is gonna be formed, and that link is gonna be strong meaning that activation is going to spread readily from the node of African-American males to the node of drugs, activating that, making us ready to think that as soon as we hear about or, or think about the concept of African-American males. And the same thing is going to happen with gun use and firearms. Every single time we see those two concepts placed together, we're going to increase our activation of that particular link. And the same thing with promiscuous sexual behavior. So we're going to increase those uh, links as well every single time that we see those two, uh, um, those two concepts go together as well. So this is an example of a negative stereotype surrounding African-American males. But these aren't the only links that we have. So we see African-American males in other, um, in other situations. So very recently, we saw an African-American male as president in the White House, so President Barack Obama. So everything, every single time people saw President Barack Obama, you strengthened the association between African-American male and leader. You strengthened the association between African-American male and successful person. You strengthened that association between African-American male and you know political figure every single time you saw Barack Obama. Every single time Neil deGrasse Tyson appears on TV and corrects the science in a movie, you see it, you strengthen your connections between African-American male and scientist, African-American male, and in this case, business suit, African-American male and uh, you know professor or teacher, every single time you saw Neil deGrasse Tyson. And if you are one of the few people that saw the uh, reboot of the Power Rangers, they had an extremely interesting take on the Blue Ranger. So the Blue Ranger in this case was an African-American uh, teenage boy, but did not fall into the typical stereotypes. So he was a, uh, a scientist. He was your typical uh, high school, you know, science. I don't use the word uh, geek, but uh, let's just say a typical uh, science protege. And very importantly, and very kind of, um, going against the grain and, and trying to battle these stereotypes, he was the least violent of all the Power Rangers. So there was a scene early on where he was being bullied in detention and he did not fight back. He did not get aggressive. He did not pull out a gun. He was not violent. It was left to the Red Ranger to actually intervene into this bully situation. So every single time you saw him not react to violence, that association between African-Americans and nonviolence got stronger. African-Americans and science got stronger every single time you saw this character in this movie. So what happens to your uh, association and to your links in this situation? Well, let's take our African-American male and we will move him to the center. Any moment now. All right, so let's take a look at our uh, spreading activation network now for African-American males. So uh, we have negative stereotypes, we got positive uh, associations, negative associations. So let's take that model and we'll move it. We'll move it to the center just so that we have the connections a little bit more clear. So let's start off with the negative uh, uh, links first. So if that's what you see most often, if those are the images that are portrayed in the media the most often, in the news, in the movies, then those links are going to be very strong. And activation is going to spread very quickly from the association, from the node of African-American male 
to the nodes of drugs, guns, and promiscuous sexual, promiscuous sexual behavior. On the other hand, if you don't see President Barack Obama very much, then that's not going to be a very strong link. It's not going to be a very highly associated item. And the same thing if you don't see African-American scientists very often, or if we don't see African-American nonviolent characters in the media. So what can happen, though? How can we change these particular associations? Well, if what we're exposed to, if the associations that we're exposed to change, our semantic networks will update to, uh, to represent that change. They'll update to accommodate for that change. So if the media starts portraying African-American males not with drugs, African-American males not with guns, African-American males not with promiscuous sexual behavior, those links of association will go down. They will decrease as time goes on. And the more and more we see African-American males in leadership positions in politics, African-American males as scientists, African-American males as nonviolent heroes in movies, then those associations will get strengthened. So this is the way to battle against uh, racism. It's one of the ways to battle against racism or any of the isms by simply strengthening the links by association to the positive associations and getting rid of those stereotypical negative associations by just not portraying them. So that idea of representation in Hollywood, that idea of you know having women in uh, heroic roles, having African-American males in heroic roles, um, not portraying uh, them with guns, all of that is very important in terms of diminishing the links to the stereotypical information and strengthening the links to other information. So that with this model, when somebody says African-American male, you will have to put in much more activation to start thinking about drugs, guns, and uh, promiscuous sexual behavior, but you will be very ready to think about scientists. You'll be very ready to think about political leader. You'll be very ready to think about nonviolent hero if those are the associations that you have a history of. All right, so that was a look at uh, that particular negative uh, stereotype of African-American males. And this goes for just about any stereotype uh, that you know of. So it includes stereotypes for um, Caucasian males as well. So Caucasian males come with the stereotype of, you know, they're typically seen as uh, successful. They're typically seen as running the world. Uh, they're typically seen as being wealthy, uh, being able to afford a luxurious lifestyle. They're typically seen as being academically uh, successful. And uh, this is something that is, again, perpetrated in our uh, society. So just very recently, if you take a look at the news on the college admission scandal, uh, it was almost exclusively uh, Caucasian uh, people. So not just Caucasian males, but Caucasian women, Caucasian women as well. But this idea of that kind of like successful um, association is, again, a stereotype because there are a lot of people across different races that are struggling that need uh, that need help. And stereotypes can be uh, barriers to those individuals getting that help. So once again, we have this idea of an association and a spreading activation model where the concepts that you see go together over and over and over again. Caucasians and academic uh, success, Caucasians and uh, being rich, Caucasians and you know living an easy lifestyle. Those are important associations that occur that can influence our behavior. And one particularly important uh, real world application of this came from the very recent Black Lives Matters uh, movement. So in this recent movement, police and police uh, activities came under scrutiny in terms of uh, whether they are racially motivated or not. And one of the things that we need to understand is that these stereotypes can affect an individual even if they're not racist. These stereotypes can change your behavior even if they're not racist. And especially if you are in a split second uh, decision making situation. So one of the typical things that officers need to address very quickly is what is that thing that you're pulling out of your pocket? So they very quickly have to decide, is that a weapon or is that a wallet? You know, do I need to take action or am I about to see some ID? 
And the decision that is made can be impacted very much by the activation, uh, by the spreading activation model and the links that are already in place. Because if we take a look back at our models here, if you are pull, if you uh, if a police officer pulls over a Caucasian male, notice what is being activated, what is being spread to. As soon as you see that Caucasian male, academic success, money, and and uh, luxurious lifestyles. So because of that, that police officer is much more ready to see, much more ready to think about money and interpret that ambiguous object as a wallet. Whether or not the police officer is racist or not, these are stereotypes that are perpetuated in our society. Whether you believe them or not, if you know them, you have them represented in your mind. Look at what happens for the African-American male. When the African-American male is seen, that activates the spreading activation in this particular semantic model, and it makes gun much more likely to be seen, much more likely to be what your interpretation goes in that split second because you, because of the spreading activation model, you're much more ready to see gun. So that ambiguous information, uh, that ambiguous object is much more easily interpreted as a gun because your mind, because of these activations, is much more ready to see gun in this particular case. So you can see that it goes well beyond the idea of, oh, you're faster at saying nurse after you see doctor. It goes well beyond that out of the lab into real life-changing important events and also into important ways of of uh counteracting these issues so one of the sort of knee-jerk reactions in the black lives matter movement was that a lot of police officers must be racist right if these attacks on african americans continue to occur it has to be because of racism in the police force it has to be because somehow they've been infiltrated uh by racists but it's just not true this is a uh, this is uh, completely because of the stereotypes that exist in our society and the sort of stereotypes that are associated with caucasian males versus the stereotypes that are associated with african-american males and importantly in analyses of the data on black lives matter what they found was that caucasian officers and uh, african-american officers were just as likely to fall prey to these uh, stereotypical types of activities so how do we combat it well we don't combat it with necessarily with sensitivity training we don't combat it necessarily with um, training directly related to uh, racism because it's not a racism problem what we do combat it with is the associations what this world needs is it needs more barack obamas it needs more neil degrasse tysons it needs more portrayals of these positive uh, associations between African Americans and other traits so that those traits are strengthened and other traits will get weakened over time. So if that's what we can do, that is the way to combat stereotypes, racism, and sexism is to experience those new associations. Because each time you experience a new association, you're going to make a new connection. And each time you uh, do not experience a stereotypical association each time you don't fall under uh, or see a stereotype being perpetrated then you weaken your old connections so every time you see this image you strengthen your connection between guns and african americans every single time you see this image you strengthen your association between uh, political leaders and african americans so by changing the media by changing how different ethnic groups are portrayed what you can do is you can change a, a network that people have that looks like this with very strong associations to drugs, guns, and promiscuous sexual behavior with the right types of association, with the correct type of representation in the media, you can take that association and change it. And you can change it to one where there are positive associations. And this can happen in the media. This can also happen in society and in your own personal experience as well. So there was a very interesting uh, study, just to comment on this, give you a little bit of experimental data on this. There is a very interesting study that came out recently in ethnic and racial studies that looked at uh, Christian nationalism and white racial boundaries, specifically whether or not somebody was opposed to their daughter in a mixed race marriage. So whether or not they're, if they, uh, how much they would object to their hypothetical daughter 
marrying an African American, um, a, uh, a Latino or an Asian. So what they did is they took a look at a number of different factors. So these are all the sort of factors that they looked at to see if a person was not at all comfortable with their hypothetical daughter's marriage to an African American individual. What I want you to uh, what I want to uh, to show you though, the one I want you to focus on is this one right here, which is interracial contact. So it's it's represented as no close black friends. So if they had, if this person had no close black friends, they were much more opposed, they were much more significantly opposed to their hypothetical daughter in an interracial marriage than if they did have a close black friend. That's what that number there means. So what that means is that by being exposed to African-American individuals in a friendly situation, strengthened all of those positive aspects, strengthened the aspects of you know, good providers, strengthen the aspects of, you know, um, good companion, uh, supportive individual, and weakened all the negative aspects so that when these individuals thought about what would an African American be like, all of those positive associations got activated and they could see their hypothetical daughter being much uh, more uh, happy in that particular marriage. So this is real, this is good evidence, hard evidence that that type of new associations can actually change your activation network. All right, and the last thing we're gonna to touch on, we're talking a lot about uh, Collins and Killian's, uh, sorry, Colin and Loftus' spreading activation model, but it is a very important kind of way of thinking about racism and sexism and all the isms. And the last one we're gonna talk about is an issue in sexism, and it's the issue of toxic masculinity. So this was a hot button topic about a year ago, and it had to deal with the idea that there are certain traits in masculinity that are toxic. And uh, while true, the actual toxic masculinity concept fell under the effect of toxic masculinity, specifically the idea that males are always in control. So this idea that males are always in control is part of this toxic masculinity, that they have to be the puppeteers, that they have to be, you know, that the world is run by, uh, run by males. And that made its way into toxic masculinity. So the people that came up with this concept we're actually suffering from the same kind of toxic ideas about masculinity that they were trying to draw attention to. And all of that kind of came into sharp focus in the Gillette commercial. So I'm about to show you this particular commercial here. You probably have seen it uh, before or clips of it. So all of this came into sharp focus in this Gillette commercial. And uh, in this situation, kind of try to see what the hidden bias in this commercial actually is. The Me Too movement against sexual harassment. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> what I actually think she's trying to say making the same old excuses boys will be boys boys will be boys boys will be boys but something finally changed allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment once but she says and there will be no going back because we we believe in the best in men well sweetie come on to say the right thing to act the right way. Oh, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. No, men. And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. So don't treat each other with that. Okay. Because the boys watching today all right so i'll stop it there that was, that was a whole commercial but very importantly i want to draw attention to this particular scene here so all through that uh all through that commercial one of the things that you'll notice is that there is not a single female in that commercial that has any agency of her own 
there's not a single female in that commercial that is either contributing to the problem or making it uh, making it better. So that in itself is toxic masculinity. The idea that females are just going to be on the wayside and just not be able to do anything. But in this in this um, in this scene in particular, this is particularly disturbing because you see all these fathers standing around, and this and the thing that they said was, well, you know, boys will be boys. Their boys were fighting, and they just excused it as boys will be boys. And this one was particularly jarring because in my personal experience, I have rarely ever heard any father say boys will be boys, but I have heard tons of mothers say that boys will be boys and excuse their son's behavior. So you can see that in this concept of toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity has come in. Those associations of males are in charge, males are in control, came into this very commercial that was trying to fight against that idea and basically had an entire commercial where males were depicted as being in control. Males were depicted as being the powerful, uh, um, uh, powerful sex with agency. So again, it's this very kind of real repercussions of this spreading activation model, because in our society, we're continually told men are in control. Men are the ones with positions of power. Men are the CEOs. Men are the bosses. And that association becomes very, very strong so that we miss some of these ideas. We miss some of these uh, concepts. And I remember that, you know, there was a discussion group, there was an article about a discussion group that started to include men and non-binary people. And even they forgot about including women in this entire discussion. So again, the implications of the spreading activation model, it's huge. And if we want to try to stop bad behavior and if we want to try to overcome all of these kind of isms that are harming us as people, we have to recognize our own sort of spreading activation models and how they're associated and start to fight against those associations ourselves. All right, so that was our look at uh, our beginning look at conceptual knowledge. We're gonna continue on looking at conceptual knowledge uh, next time when we take a look at um, distributed processing uh, networks. But uh, until then, thanks for joining me and uh, take care of yourself and I will see you next time.